The primary options that have been looked at are wind, solar, wave power, and the use of biofuels and biogases. And I've got a few examples of those here. They've come from a number of recent studies that have been produced by ARENA, by Lloyd's Register, and some by the Royal Academy of Engineering. This is a new invention for shipping in this generation. So if we look at wind energy, there are a range of options available with soft sails, with increasing number of designs, from little cargo catamarans, which would be suitable for village use, up to quite large container ships, um, container ships, bulk carriers, tankers, etc. Fixed wing sails, which were trialled by the Japanese in the last oil crisis, dramatic uh, savings of up to 30% available, and these are also being considered, especially for large ships today. Rotor technology, invented by the Germans in the 1920s, also scheduled to make a comeback as a suction wing freighters, as used by Jacques Cousteau on his research vessel, the Alcyon. Kite sails too. In solar energy, the vessel that you can see in the upper right-hand corner has been operating commercially in Sydney Harbour since 2001. It used sails made out of photovoltaic material to drive small, efficient, fast harbour ferries. There is a range of applications, especially in the tourist industry, that this could play. Biofuels, especially for our outer islands, using coconut or biomass, is also has strong possibilities. So, how do we transition the Pacific to low carbon transport? There's been a lack of focus, as I said earlier, on transport and we preferred to focus on the low-hanging fruit of electricity. But this lack of focus makes this the ideal time to establish a coordinated regional strategy to transition to low carbon. Danger is that if we don't have a coordinated strategy, we end up with a whole lot of small, ad hoc, unmonitored projects. Regional and international research has identified there are a number of barriers to such a transition to low carbon. Those barriers are policy, for example, all Pacific Island countries have set policy targets for reducing their reliance on fossil fuel for electricity. However, only one, the Marshall Islands, has set a target for transport. Now, donors won't fund the transition to low carbon economy until the countries indicate, through the use of strategic policy measures, that this is what they want to have happen to them next. Second major barrier is financing. Donors claim it's a private sector issue. We argue that it must be a PPP, a private-public partnership. And governments need to consider a range of financing mechanisms and incentives, such as tax and import duty reductions, in order to encourage the sector. Perception is a major barrier. There is a lack of awareness, mis misinformation of the options that are available. What alternatives are there? And the Pacific mindset is that answers must come from the global to the local. However, as a number of international experts are pointing out to us, the Pacific makes the ideal testing ground for new technologies and approaches because of its small-scale vessel use. It's a lot less expensive to trial vessels at small scale than it is at large scale. What is required is a whole sector, multiple stakeholder, multidisciplinary approach in order to build long-term in-region capacity to address this critical transition. So why do we think that renewable energy might have a role to play? Well, in the last oil crisis, in the 1970s and the 1980s, there were a range of projects that happened here in the Pacific. Look at the agencies that were involved in it. The Asian Development Bank, the European Union, various members of the United Nations family, including UNDP, ESCAP, FAO, even NGOs like Save the Children Fund, were running low carbon sea transport programs in the last oil crisis. Just for one example, here in Fiji, we, the ship, the Nā Matui Sao, um, which was the ship of the government shipping service, 274 tonne cargo passenger freighter, was fitted with soft sails designed and built here in Fiji in an experiment overseen by Southampton University. That experiment demonstrated easily that this vessel could save between 23 and 30% of fuel average across all routes in Fiji. 
There are a number of things that could have been done, such as putting the vessel with a folding prop, which would have greatly increased its fuel savings. Importantly to note, the investment rate of return on the best route was 123%, but it averaged 35% across all routes. So we have to conclude from that that this technology could be a major saver of fuel here in Fiji and across the Pacific today. If we look at what sort of program that is needed in order to transition to low country to sorry, what sort of program is needed to transition to low carbon sea transport, we can see that you require a range of different priorities. There is a range of policy mechanisms that must be put in place, and these must be both strategic policy from the international to the local level and infrastructural policy. Economics has a critical role to play. The commercial sector and private enterprise will not pick up this transition until the economics and the commercial viability of it can be demonstrated. In the Pacific, heritage has a, has a unique role to play. The ability to sail across oceans at will was of course the greatest technological legacy of this ocean. In heritage, valorising those traits of the, of the ancestors and their remarkable seafaring prowess is, provides a soft entry point to a transition to wind-powered propulsion. We need to do proof of, of concept. We need to provide practical examples of working technology on the water in a commercial setting before it is going to be taken up by the private sector. Teaching, education and additional research also play critical roles. And as I said earlier, this requires a whole of sector approach. Industry, government, researchers, community must work collectively in order to achieve this goal. So in summary, transport is a critical role to play in addressing climate change. At the international level, small island development states need to press for binding action on reducing bunker emissions to stay under a 1.5 degree global warming threshold. If we continue to ignore the threat from bunkers, achieving that 1.5 degree threshold will, will be simply unachievable. At the domestic level, reducing our dependency on imported fuel must be an absolute priority for all governments. And, as I said, transport uses 70% plus of that fuel largely ignored to date. So sustainable options are urgently required. Sadly, the transport sector and its nexus with climate change in the Pacific has been largely ignored to date. Now is the time for a coordinated regional strategy. There are solutions available, but there are also critical barriers that must be overcome. And I underscore, a whole sector approach is absolutely essential. There's a range of resources on this fast emerging field and Funaka Wakalevu and thank you for joining me today in this UNESCO Masterclass Series.